Okay. I don't know why it's being so slow opening. Should have left it open while I was. Hey, you got my podcast, so it, I mean, it'd work. Yep, I can use that if it ends up not working. I do have that I can share. So um, it is 5.30. We started letting people in here. Um, got a big crowd. We're already up to 99 participants. So I think it's going to be an awesome, awesome evening. Uh, this is a topic that we have discussed a lot, but we've never actually really dedicated a lot of time to talking about perennials in a uh, crop rotation. So I've probably received the most questions ahead of time through email about this topic than any other webinar we've done. So we've got a lot of questions to get to, but before we do that, um, I'll just kind of go over the rules for those who have not been here before with us. Thank you for joining. Um, everybody is muted. And if you do have questions during the uh, presentation, you can type those out either in the Q&A or in the chat feature, uh, whether you're on Zoom or I'll be watching if you are checking Facebook as well. I'll be looking at those. Um, what we're going to do is a little bit different this evening since we have two uh, panelists. We're going to let them each present for about 15 minutes, and then we're going to get to some of our most common questions about this topic and open it up to the audience for the last 15 minutes. So should take about an hour. Uh, we do have some awesome people on here this evening. Dale, if you wanna go ahead and introduce our panelists, uh, we can get started. Hey, sure. I, I think uh, as we learn more and more about soil health and what creates soil health and, and learning how, the importance of root exudates, we go searching for plants that make more root exudates all those extremely high root exudate plants are perennials. And the fastest route to creating better soil is with perennial plants. And of course, the way you make money off of perennial plants ordinarily is to graze them, you know, have a pasture. And so incorporating pastures into a crop rotation is something that's been been done for centuries actually, but it's a, a technology that's been completely forgotten about for over half a century, really since about World War II. Uh, putting pasture into crop rotations become passe, old fashioned. Now we're re realizing that you simply cannot substitute anhydrous ammonia and DDT uh, like they did after World War II. Uh, for the effects of what that pasture does to soil quality. And so we, when we came up with this topic, we decided we'd talk to some people who have been doing this and, and uh, what their experiences are. And so that's why we asked Keith Thompson and Josh Lloyd to join us for this. And um, they can share their experiences. And uh, if those of you that are not familiar with these guys, uh, Keith Thompson, if you've heard of the Thompson closing wheel, here's the inventor of that. And so, um, and Josh, former president, No Till on the Plains, which has been uh, an organization that's been uh, extremely, well, you, you've both been very involved in No Till on the Plains, uh, extremely influential organization. And uh, here are two of the big movers and shakers in the past, uh, in the past with that organization. So, um, I think the, uh, the North American continent owes a debt of gratitude to that organization and these guys for being part of it. So Keith, uh, why don't you take off and, and share a little bit about your experiences with, with uh, inserting perennial pastures into a crop rotation. Uh, thank you, Dale, I'll do that. Thanks to Green Cover Crops for asking me to do this. Get it going. Perennial pastures and cropping. Well, my uh, first introduction to seeing this uh, perennial pastures uh, was on a trip to South America in 1999. And with the help of Dr. Dwayne Beck of the Dakota Lakes Research 
station. He wanted to just go down there and look at more advanced no-till ideas and how they were using uh, long-term brakes to control many problems, weeds and insects and so on. And Matt, the late Matt Hagney and I, uh, Doug Pollan, my son Ben and I, uh, spent three weeks traveling around looking at things down there. We looked at uh, tons of different systems and how diversity, intensity, and rotations were applied. And that every farm we were on had half of the acreage in uh, this perennial pasture deal because they told us that the gotcha was a big deal down there and, and uh, they really kept that alive. And, uh, and uh, we just did lots of discussion, I know, looking at seeding systems and also at the perennial pasture side. And uh, like, it, like I said, it's about half and half. One thing we did not understand when we were talking to them was how little fertilizer they used. And uh, we talked about it and they didn't really know. So we went to the University of Buenos Aires and we talked to some soil people and they, they weren't too sure exactly either. They thought that probably the deal was that they were really young soils compared to us for how long they'd been farming. And they were just probably uh, using up some long-term carbon systems. And uh, when that was gone, they'd be fertilizing just like us. And it was many, many years later that dawned me that the soil health principles explained what was happening. Remember, this was long before anybody understood a thing about biology. We, that was not in our mind. And uh, come to think, think about it, you know, perennial pasturing has the five systems, principles working 24 seven year round, super start charging that soil biology. And we know what they are that on my farm, we start off just no tilling. And then I was telling uh, Keith earlier that Carlos Corvetto, Corvetto visited my farm and uh, he said, you need more residue. So that was something we started working on in 1998 and more diversity in the system. And then my son got the bug for the livestock going down there in South America and we started using livestock and cover crops and all that. This is our first grazing mix in 07. Ben got cattle going and uh, we planted this grazing mix just on our own, didn't know anything what we was doing. We just kind of gathered anything we could find on the farm and planted it in the, through the drill. And he broke it up into paddocks. And what we discovered was if you can see in the background, there's a, there a native pasture. And uh, he would graze these perennials. These, these were just covers. And when grazing completely down, he'd move them back to the pasture. Then he'd come back about 40 days later. It was kind of a, going back and forth. And now I was kind of worried about how that would affect farming later, but come to find out it didn't. Jump again, this is many years later. This is a farm, been farmed for crop for over 50 years. This is the first perennial pasture. And I uh, decided to plant this after I, I <clears throat> on another trip in, to okay. South America, I met Admir Karagari, and he came back up, you know, and he came up and spoke at a no-till conference a couple of times in 06 oh, really and 2012, it. he talked about grazing and how they were using the grazing systems to nope. do this. And he came back to Osage and I told my son, said, uh, we need to do this. And he said, dad, I've been trying to talk you into this for years. So there's a problem there. The first one, got to get, learn, listen to your kids. And uh, we planted this to perennials. And what we didn't understand was doing it right in front of a drought. We didn't get very many perennials. And so every spring and fall, we would plant annuals. And you can see that in here. And you can see how drought stress this is. It was pretty, it was pretty tough. What we uh, discovered when we went back to crops, we was able to reduce our fertilizer like they did down in South America. And I mentioned the grazing covers and perennials extended our permanent pasture, uh, allowed us to be almost a month later before we went back to permanent pasture. So the yields, the first year we had soybeans and the yield of that field was 17% higher than, I've been farming this place over 40 years. So in that 40 years, it was 17% higher than the highest yield we'd ever had. And it was 47% above the long-term average. Next year, I planted corn and soybeans. The corn made 9% higher than the highest yield we'd ever had. 
and it was 48% above a long-term average. The model in that same field is 5% higher than the long-term average and 40, 34% above the average for all those years. And then the third year, which was last year, the soybeans were three years out and they were 10% above the highest yield. Now this was, I didn't use the highest yield before, it was just the long-term average. I, I used the same numbers. So we could see it might be a little going down, but still it was 38% above long-term average. And we cut back on nitrogen about uh, 35%, if I remember right. We no, since this farm went in the perennial pasture, we put no P and K on it. So it's had been seven years since any P and K has been applied. And there was, you could, you know, it was really didn't need anything. It, nitrogen was a big thing that we put on. And one of the things I did discover, we had taken soil tests down to, <laughs> hard to believe, I can go 56 inches before I hit a shell that's impermeable. And I have a real low zinc uh, test all time. Dr. Ward is always telling me to put zinc on. And no matter how I go through my soil, <clears throat> I don't have any zinc really low levels all the way down to the bottom. And Dr. Ward told me, he says, well, Keith, that explains why I'm always telling you, you got to put zinc on. You know, I don't have any to recycle. So that's a, a point in soil test helps me. This is our second time we planted a perennial pasture. And we're going to go on a six and seven year break. Uh, that was uh, something that uh, Edimir said that they had kind of got it when we were down there the first time, three to four years, that's what they were doing. He said six to seven years breaks was make, maximizing their income. And there was 12 different things on this, we, in this mix. And, you know, we're hoping again, you know, and more nutrients and uh, organic matter. Definitely see their better water infiltration already on this farm. When it rains, just literally no water runs out of it anymore. Of course, the livestock's forage, we're looking for weed control. That's interesting. In all three years, there's been a different kind of a mix of what grew of, of all the things we plant. Uh, definitely the erosion thing is, is making a difference. My son was up, uh, it rained here just the other day, we had an inch 20 and the field across the road, which is the first perennial pasture. Remember it's been three years out, it's going on our fourth. And that soil is losing some of its structure. Still really good soil structure. You'll see some pictures here a little later. But this field, you could drive all over it. Just like you always said, if it rains, you know, where's the first place to drive? You drive out in the native pasture. In three years, it's already got great soil structure. And we're looking for the fungal part of our system to get going. And like I mentioned, it rests our native pasture. This is what it looked like last summer. That's my son and my grandson checking. We use poly wires, you know, for breaks. And if you want to know what my son decides, that he tries not to overgraze it because we want this to last as long as it can. You can kind of see all the different things growing. This is what it looks like just the other day. Um, there's a hundred and just for your, there's 171 acres in this that we did in this particular field. Um, and those tracks going up through there. Another thing we've learned that if you plan an annual in there, it kind of kickstarts it in the spring. Now, last year we used uh, oats. This year we used perennial rye. And this is what it looks like to get, you can't see it in that first picture. That's what it looks like down real close. This is my neighbor's field uh, right across the fence from us, same soil type. I just dug this up the other day. Um, not much structure going on there, not much of anything. It, matter of fact, just wanted to fall apart. Really, I can hardly get it over to where I want to take side by side pictures. This is uh, from that same field that our, our perennials are at. And you can see there's an earthworm there, just about what, an inch, two inches above the, below the soil surface. You can see the different granulation. You can see the roots. I, this, it just hangs together. It's unbelievable how much nicer this is. Here's the two side by side, so you can kind of get a, a look at it. The tilled soil and the perennial. There's just no structure. Matter of fact, I wanted to walk 
the same distance, there's a field road that separates it. And I wonder, I took 20 some steps out into ours, dug up and I took 20 some steps. And I was, after three steps after into his field, I was wishing I, that was a dumb idea. I couldn't hardly get my boots out of the field. It's something where this is a field day we had last year. And there on my right is our soils. And this is 45 minutes later. And I think what this, you know, really shows is you know, it's a good old slate test. We've all seen it. This is my soils. I remember when he dropped those clods in there, I was like, oh boy, what is going to happen? Because I was really going honest with you. You don't really know. You believe it, you see it. But like this was really uh, uh, eye opener, even for myself. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> like I said, this was a, a really, to me, a really good test. And so, one of the things I've one of the things that I've decided that's happening that really is the important thing to think of is biology is a new chemistry and on farming. Uh, you gotta, I'm not saying I don't use any chemistry. That's not true. Uh, we cut back. I'm trying to get where we use as little as we can to maximize profits. Uh, so I'm gonna rely on the biology. That's a real quick run through of our farm. And uh, I'll stop right there and stop my share and let Josh have it. All right, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Sounds good. Okay. Hold on. I'm... Yeah, so I added uh, cattle and hair sheep probably about eight or nine years ago as a way to get more income per acre off of the cropland. Uh, we were planting covers, and so we had these grazing windows where we could... Um, um, yeah, graze livestock, basically, um, you know, depending on which enterprise you wanted to as associate the cost with for free, if you, you know, we were planting the covers just for um, weed control and to build soil. And then like Keith talked about, I'd heard about uh, the perennial breaks down in South America. And, and so with the idea that in order to build soil, you have to have a constant living root and you have to be constantly harvesting sunlight unless it's you know in dormancy the best way to do that was with a perennial break is what i felt like um yeah so i was just wanting to increase my yield and de decrease my inputs um and i knew from things that i'd seen on the farm which i'm going to go through here you know the way to do that was to to build organic matter and, and not only that, just create an environment that, you know, balanced the nutrient cycle and the water cycle. And to do that, you know, I was already no-till, so I wasn't doing any tillage, but um, I needed to eliminate any fallow and then add plant diversity uh, in the crop rotation. And, and then um, through the perennial break was that able to add a lot of diversity. And so, if, if we think about um, what we see in our, like the native ecosystem and when people talk about organic matter and, um, you know, carbon, biology, roots, microbes, residue, livestock, it's all, that's all life, that's all carbon. And if you look at this system, um, you know, you've got the plants that, diversity of plants there harvesting the sunlight they're sending that down to their roots, growing roots, feeding the microbes, um, sequestering carbon. Uh, then you have the above ground livestock that are harvesting that and putting manure back. And because it's not disturbed um, by tillage, and you know, you get a you get a balanced nutrient cycle, which is why you know we don't see nutrient deficiencies in nature, unless it's been disturbed by human, human beings. So 
you know, it really shouldn't surprise us at all that we have to add inputs to our cropland. Uh, if we compare the two systems, you know, on the left, you're, you're doing tillage, which is burning off your carbon as CO2. Then because you're tilling it, you're eroding it away and exporting your carbon that way. And then as it sits there fallow, you're not adding carbon back to the system. And then when you don't have a diversity of plants, you're not adding carbon. To so there's, there's just your, your water cycle, your nutrient cycle, it's all wrecked. As opposed to if you look at the perennial break on the right, you, you don't see any tillage, you don't see any um, fallow, and you have all this diversity of plants going on that are cycling, um, living and dying and, and cycling at different times to create a balance. I don't, with my perennial breaks, I don't add any fertilizer. They, you know, I don't need to because they come into equilibrium and, and build organic matter and, and, and feed themselves. And, it, and we see the same thing in, in forest systems. Think about it, you don't see a sickly nitrogen, nitrogen de deficient forest unless we come in and disturb it. And the same thing's true in our grasslands. A lot of people, you hear a lot of people say that um, we can't uh, move back to pastured livestock. You know, we've got to have a feedlot system. Well, it's because not only do we farm poorly in a lot of cases, we, in most cases, people graze poorly. I mean, you're not in this particular situ situation you're not allowing that grass to harvest sunlight and send carbon down into the soil. So it's, it's losing its productivity because it's constantly um, being grazed and, and not being allowed to sequester carbon. It's really just uh, a lot of our pastures are really just feedlots, uh, grass feedlots is all they are and for, for our summer months, and then we move them into winter feedlots. So uh, the topsoil that our native ecosystem has been eroded away. A lot of people, you know, when you open up a soil survey, it focuses on sand, silt, and clay. That is that is geology, that is not topsoil. Topsoil is carbon. It was built through those principles of no tillage, uh, no fallow, constantly harvest, harvesting sunlight and diversity. What we're actually farming is what I've labeled there now on top. We're farming that geology that is, was underneath. And so depending on where you are um, and what you were blessed with uh, underneath, you, you know, you can be you're either farming, you know, in some cases, heavy clays, or you're farming really nice, you know, loams or sands in the extremes. So here is a, a yield map that shows productivity based on topsoil versus geology. Uh, this, the yield map on the right is of wheat and uh, green and blue are good, pink, orange, yellow are bad. And you can see a square of green and blue there in the middle of that field, this whole, this entire field is the same soil type, according to sand, silt, and clay, according to the soil survey. So why are we seeing this 50% uh, increase in yield with all of the other management being the same? It's because where we have, where you see the green and the blue, we have the topsoil that's labeled high yield in that soil, soil profile to your left, and where um, yield is poor, it's because we're farming geology. And then this compares the yield map to organic matter. So this is grid sampling on, on the two and a half acre grids. And you can see the, the organic matter is double where um, the high yield is. And I, 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 may, I think maybe I left out the fact that what we did here, this that used to be a pasture 10 years ago. If I, before I had cattle, otherwise I probably wouldn't have sprayed the grass out 
and started to farm it, but it's never been tilled. And that's, that's the advantage is it's never been tilled. That's why it still has its top soil. And then here's, here is uh, the phosphorus grid sampling. Notice that where the, the high yielding area is, phosphorus levels are very low. Uh, and where the low yielding areas are, phosphorus levels are high. Uh, and we're not adding huge amounts of phosphorus. Um, so what this shows in my opinion is that our number one yield limiting nutrient is carbon, carbon and water. And you're not going to increase carbon or increase water by doing tillage, letting it sit in fallow and, and having a limited diversity. So planting a perennial break uh, with, within your cropping system is a way to um, build all that back. I'll go quickly through these. These are just, again, um, it's another field that compares topsoil versus subsoil and yield. Where the, those circles are is where it's never been tilled. We brought it into production versus where it's been tilled for the last 120 years. This is sorghum. Um, those green areas roughly are yielding probably 120 bushel on average, whereas the brown, orange, yellow areas are closer to you know, 70. All other inputs are the same. It's just, you've got that, you've got nutrient cy cycling going on from all that organic matter that's increasing yield. You see the same thing the next year with soybeans and it's not going to need nitrogen. It's just because of all the, um, the water availability that the organic matter brings. And then the following year with wheat. So what I'm trying to show here is across years, across different crops, carbon is what impacts yield. Here's an old feedlot. Um, this was tilled way back when, and then for over the last probably 50 years, it was a feedlot until we, we took it out of, we got rid of feedlots. I don't, I don't use feedlots anymore. Everything's out pastured. Um, but you can see within that green line or those orange lines, excuse me, how the, the wheat is very green and vegetative as opposed to right across the fence line, the old fence line, where it's not as vegetative. And here's just a close up of the two systems. So what are we seeing here is, you know, in a feedlot, we've been importing uh, all this organic matter in the form of, you know, hay and grain and concentrating it within that feedlot. So where I took the picture, it was uh, where that green area is on the green, on the grid sampling map. And so you can see the, the reason it's lush is because the organic matter, again, is double what it is across the fence line to where um, we didn't have all this carbon added in a feedlot system. And then if you look at the grid sampling as it relates to nitrogen, that organic matter, because it's higher in organic matter, it's got more nitrogen and other nutrients to release naturally. Um, so if you can build your topsoil, essentially you'll have more nutrients that will be released in that cycle so that you don't have to add inputs as time goes on. And then here's two comparative pictures. These were taken in the same spot in the field, but they're 10 years apart. You can see the one on the right, how dense and, and light and heavy that clay was. That was it. This was taken in the bottom of a terrace. And then the, the one on the, the left is where after 10 years of no-till with just, the only thing we had eliminated was um, fallow after the wheat crop. We still, for that 10 year period, would let it sit fallow in the, in the winter when everything was dormant. But, and then we've, we have had limited diversity. So my point being with, it, the improvements could have been even greater than what we're seeing there if we had, um, planted 
a, a cover crop in the winter and increased our diversity even more. This, these pictures have not had a perennial break on them, but it shows that with a perennial break, using all those practices of no-till, no fallow diversity, that we can build that topsoil back. That, that topsoil was not deposited. So when you hear people say, oh, well, we've got deep topsoils, you know, 20 foot deep topsoils, you don't have 20 foot deep topsoils. That's not what topsoil is. Topsoil is that carbon rich layer at the surface. Um, so here's just a picture of where I've got my hair sheep and there's some, there's some cattle out here. This was um, rye cover crop that I planted corn into and now I'm out unrolling bales on this. I don't want my livestock in a lot. I want that manure back out on the field so that I'm, I'm building, um, building those soils quicker. This has been planted to rye. It's just, it, we're so, so, so dormant that it just hasn't greened up yet. Uh, this is, but that, th that picture was taken last week. Um, this is my perennial break. It is a, and yeah, oh, hold on here. Hopefully this will play for you. All right, so I hope that played. <laughs> um, nobody's texted me to tell me I'm, my screen's froze up. So uh, hopefully that shows I, I, kind of what it looks like when I move them to what they move into. This is a mix of clovers, alfalfa, chicory, bird's foot tree full, um, you know, fescues, wheatgrass, brome. Uh, so just a very diverse, mix this was probably this uh, well not probably this was at least the second time that i had ran them through this part of the field uh or this part of the perennial break in the year um by i, I move them twice a day so that's right now i'm trying to figure out this is a little bit uh inconvenient but i'm using the paddock size based on that, that amount of sheep is two 164 foot long nets long and one net wide. So if you make a square 164 by 164, that is about 0.6 acres. And where I'm too long, that's about 1.2 acres. So they get 1.2 acres in the morning and 1.2 acres in the afternoon. And that is, that was probably about um, 500 sheep, 600 sheep. There's a lot of trample, but that's, that's good. Um, you know, that's, that's what's going to help feed the biology. And I want to just hit it quick and then let it rest. I don't want to, I don't want to grub it to the ground. People, People overgraze things too much. There's just another kind of shot of what it looks like. One up close. Um, here is later in this in the summer. These are both both these paddocks have been grazed. This is just uh, and they're probably getting ready for a move. This just shows kind of the net. 
the fencer, and then I'm using um, HDPE pipe from a well. I've got five rolls of 500 foot where I can get water out, out to the sheep because water and, and fencing are kind of the biggest challenges. And then the other thing, this is the, the first perennial break that I did that one we were just looking at is the second one. I'm getting ready to take this one out of production here this spring, but you can see this is where um, I do some bale grazing as a way to mimic that feedlot I showed you where we bring in, um, we, not only are we constantly harvesting sunlight and building soil, but then we're also importing carbon through bales. Um, you know, I don't want, I don't want to see this on my farm. The, I, you know, this does not honor God. This does not honor the animal. Um, you know, I, it's just, uh, you know, why not move this back out into the cropland where the animal can have a quality of life and, and improve the overall productivity, productivity of your system and, and really build back God's creation, his soil, rather than just mining it. And my one last little soapbox thing here, you know, we... For me personally, I sit here and I think, why are we growing corn and beans? We, you know, we don't feed the world directly with corn and beans. We, we grow this corn and beans to feed to an animal protein and a CAFO somewhere and concentrate all those nutrients. And then they don't, they, they don't get exported back out like they should because it costs too much. Um, you know, why not bring that production back onto the land? And if you look at this map, you know, the, the red dot is where I'm at. And as you go east or as you go west, excuse me, you can see how dry it starts to get. So as you get, as you start going west, in my opinion, and even, even I, where I'm at, I'm starting to think someday, why, why maybe not plant, you know, everything or a lot more to perennials because as you get into a more fragile environment, perennials are the only thing that's gonna take advantage of the rainfall when it comes and you know, go, go dormant in those hot periods. So um, I'd challenge people to, you know, to uh, challenge, you know, question their thinking and, and really think outside the box rather than um, just staying mainstream. That's all I got. Well, thank you guys. Um, uh, Noah, do we want to just kind of start in on addressing some of the audience questions here? Or? Yeah, that might work. We can just probably do an extended Q and A session. Uh, the first one was for Keith. Uh, Tom Cannon asks, what covers did you have in between your summer annual crops following your perennial pastures? Read it one more time, Noah. What covers did you have in between your summer annual crops following your perennial pastures? We're rye, barley, trillicale, our flax, some buckwheat, um, trying to think, some brassicas, and we kind of go on the, the thought process that uh, diversity trumps intensity, so we don't really plant really thick stands of covers unless we're going to graze it. Okay. That'd be, yeah. Um, can you give an overview of how perennial pastures works after the pasture? Do you grow row crop in the grazed pasture or do you need to till it first? Well, I'll answer it and I'll let Josh have his turn. That first year we came out of our perennials, we just terminated what was there with chemical terminated it. And, and uh, I'd, actually we planted another cover 
to grow through the winter and uh, then terminated that to seed into that first year of soybeans. Yeah, we d we're doing the same thing on that. The one we're taking out of production, we sprayed it out here last fall and then went in with a, um, a mix of rye, oats, and hairy vetch. And then I'll, I'll graze that hard this spring and plant beans into it. And then I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and not use any residual herbicide on it at all. But no, I don't. I the I don't want to do any do any tillage. I mean, that would defeat kind of the the whole goal of what I'm trying to accomplish. Sure. Do, do you do you think there's a possibility? Uh, you know, of course, glyphosate is coming under fire from a lot of a lot of people. Do you think? there is a way to terminate without tillage and also without glyphosate. Yeah, I mean, I, I um, if maybe going forward, I'll, I'll not use glyphosate. I mean, when I do the initial termination, um, like everything that, everything that'll get done on this when it's beans is all going to be glufosinate, Liberty, or maybe clethodum, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get away from glyphosate. Okay, uh, Daniel asks, why go back to cash crops after you have a perennial pasture established? That's the question my son asked me just the other day. That's in this one who was showing you. Uh, our thought process is at this point, we have not made up our mind, but is it's have a rotation where we will plant as many acres that's coming out of that perennial back to a perennial. So you're rotating through. Uh, I'm guessing when my son gets it all done, our crop ground will be uh, two thirds less. Okay. Josh, do you want to answer that one or pass? No, I'll answer it. Um, yeah, I mean, that's one of the things I, I ask myself is if, if I know that um, perennials build soil and then even beyond just the economics of why do I have a half a million dollar combine, air seeder, um, sprayer, all this infrastructure. I spend all this time acquiring inputs, managing, um, you know, it, I think the economics, I'm, I'm just not ready to make that step yet. I mean, part of it's because we do have such an investment in infrastructure that's going to, that, that needs to be a uh, maybe a slow transition for multiple reasons, mentally and economically. Um, but yeah, I, I to me, why are we why are we planting corn and beans to feed livestock when it could be perennials? Um, but I, part of the reason I'm, I'm bringing it out, I guess, too, is. The perennials I'm planting tend to be more cool season. Uh, you know, the brown, I don't know, they did well this last summer, even in the heat. But yeah, I'd, I'd need to ch change my mix a little bit. And then the other thing is, especially with the first perennial where I, where I was learning and grazing and through the winter, it was pretty hard on the on the stand, uh, there's that stand needs to pick up to come out. So you mentioned there the cost uh, a little bit on or changing up your mix. Can you roughly kind of give us your seed cost to plant those perennials per acre? And we'll start with Josh on that. Yeah, you're going to spend a hundred or 
is my connection gets chopping out. It's getting a little um, choppy. Yep. Yeah. We spend about a hundred to a hundred, sorry, a hundred to $120 is what we spend on the mix. And then you've got $20 in seating, but you know, you spread that out over, um, five, six years. So that brings it down. And then you don't have, you know, herbicide costs or any of that. We're in the same range. I, I think because we're used, we have a lot of winter, we have a lot of cool season and warm seasons in our mix. So both ends are, are grazed. My son uses a lot of uh, Red River crabgrass and quick and grow in our mix. Uh, but I think the hundred dollar deal, like Josh says, that's, would you spread that? I did the first one over four years. We're gonna go six to seven. Well, you spread that over that many years, that's not that much cost per year. Yeah, that's not bad at all. Um, two questions kind of related to the fencing on the sheep. Josh, do you always use netting for your sheep or can you get by with a multi-strand poly wire and kind of along the same lines, do you use that netting for your sheep year round or just as needed? I just use the netting in the summer on that, when I'm on that perennial in the past and even going forward. Yeah. Um, I'm making an investment in high tensile for some of the perimeters and then going to use the poly. I should be able to do it with two strands of poly braid. Uh, the reason I'm using the netting, although I'm getting the numbers high enough that it's, I'm going to have to move away from the netting just otherwise I'd be moving net all the time uh, is peace of mind. <laughs> I'm so busy in the summer and I just don't want to have to worry about if they're getting out. And so with the net, it's just, it, at this point, it's just very easy to go out there, lay out, have enough netting to lay out a grid, you know, a grid. So I, I can lay out four paddocks, put the water in the center of that. And then I'm mo only moving the water every, you know, two to four days, depending on the, the paddock and how, how often I'm, I'm moving. But yeah, uh, it really, it, it can't, I just need to take the time to, to get the fence hot and put the fear of God in them of the fence. Okay. Uh, this from Facebook, Adam says, do you have any insight on biological analytics? Um, whether you guys are looking at CO2 burst numbers, PLFA, anything like that and looking at how they compare to your cropland with covers. And then lastly, are you seeing significant increases in bacteria to fungi ratios in perennial versus annual cropland? I have not really worried about that. Um, our, I think our goal is, is to look at the profitability where that ends up. Uh, People always asking us why we have the perennial pasture and my son always says it's part of the system and we, ne we need that in our system because before there was just, uh, Josh showed pictures of the cattle causing problems and we don't see that in the perennials. And then the thing that what he, we do is try to wait long enough till the cover crop grows before we move them into the cover crop and then that system there is able to hold the cattle up. Uh, I just haven't taken the time. It hasn't been something that I worried about. I just didn't, don't feel that's, I'm not, not sure how I can control the biology. I just try to add enough diversity in the system. I hope the biology takes care of itself. I had a friend tell me that if you don't have something growing in part of your field, if you put 12 things in a mix and only five of them comes, he says the biology is not there. And so that's where the cattle come in to add more biology in so we get more diversity growing. And we are seeing that. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the same as Keith. I, um, I don't know what I'd do with that information if I took it, quite honestly. Um, the, for me, I'm, I guess I know I'm putting the principles in place that we see in negative ecosystems 
and so I'm not really concerned, I guess, with monitoring that and then trying to micromanage, you know, does, how do those numbers change based off of different covers or whatever? I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's, you know, some value that for somebody to maybe do that and then I'll learn from them. But for me, it's just uh, put the principles in place to, to build soil. Okay, that might even answer kind of this question a little bit from Dennis says, do we have any way to definitively test whether or not we need to inoculate with mycorrhiza at seeding time, for example, a spring soil test ahead of seeding? Do you guys do any testing like that for mycorrhiza fungi? And if you don't, I might even let Dale kind of provide some input here as well. I haven't. The only thing I've thought be worthwhile doing is do a uh, the Johnson Sioux, you know, bioreactor to grow your own uh, for inoculant of, for your planting or crop. But I've never thought about worrying about it in the permanent pasture, the perennial pasture side. Yeah, I'm not testing that per se. Um, in the cropland, like when I plant rye, I'm start to put kind of some mycorrhizal or biological with the seed. Uh, I'm not going to do that forever. I just kind of feel like if I, if I keep a constant living root, keep it covered and not tilling it, I'm just kind of doing it like an initial inoculation to try and get that built up. I think if you get the principles in place, if you build it, they will come, I think, anyways. I'm just putting something out there to maybe build a little quicker, possibly, or give the system a little boost. But I, I don't know if I need to or, or not. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, I know Ward Laboratories will soon be offering uh, mycorrhizal colonization testing. Um, I don't, there are some labs that do that, but um, they're not traditional soil testing labs. They're kind of obscure and hard to find and, and uh, you know, slow turnaround time, et cetera. Um, I know none of the traditional soil testing labs that I've dealt with have offered mycorrhizal colonization testing. Um, they might give you a PLFA, but not, you don't really know what those numbers mean on that PLFA. Uh, so I'm very excited to have mycorrhizal colonization, you know, that possibility coming up through a traditional soil testing lab. Um, as far as the need for it, I, I've, for years, I've been a big advocate of inoculating with mycorrhizal fungi when you're planting a perennial pasture. And part of the reason for that is number one, it makes the pasture grow better. Number two, it, the glomalin exuded by the mycorrhizal hyphae is very powerful soil aggregating agent. And after all, that's what we're after. That's part of the idea behind this is to make better soil, increase soil aggregation. And uh, number three, because you've got a perennial there, once the soil becomes full of hyphae and there's no place for the hyphae to go, all that extra soil or all that extra energy gets put into spore production. And once you get spore production, you can, when you go into your, your four or five years of the annuals, those annuals will have spores. So even if you have a fallow period for some reason or another, as long as you know, you've got spores there that can re-inoculate your next crop. And the, the only places that uh, we've, that I've sampled cropland, I've seen cropland samples that had what I would consider adequate levels of mycorrhizal colonization have been in areas where there were Amish farmers that still followed a strict rotation of hay, alfalfa and clover hay in their crop rotation where they had a perennial. So I think this is, if we wanna have real strong, robust mycorrhizal populations, 
I think this concept of including a perennial pasture will give us from a single inoculation at planting the very first pasture, we can maintain those populations indefinitely, I think. Uh, Paul says, I'm sold on the idea. What are the biggest technical or social challenges you've had to overcome? Uh, uh, the first is for myself was just thinking that you could, it, it was always crops, so it's got to be cropped and just stopping that thought process in my head. Uh, for me, it wasn't for my son at all. Um, the other thing is setting up water. Josh has mentioned water a couple of times. Um, we've put, been putting in building ponds, building electric fence, perimeter fence, three wire, at least perimeter fences, um, uh, freeze proof water tanks that we put in below the ponds. Those are some things that uh, I sadly spent my first most of my half of my career getting rid of pastures and fences. And now here I am going back to fancer, pastures, putting in fences and building waters with a very, it was, it's like I've lost my mind, but it, it's, it's the way to go. That's going to tell you that. I've, that's been the best move I've ever made. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, water, fencing, are two of the biggest challenges getting, you know, and getting all that developed, um, getting the right animals. And then, and what I mean by that is um, a lot of the livestock is being propped up. I mean, you like with my, with my lambs and my cattle, both, I don't, I, even with the heifers, I don't, I don't have to pull calves. I don't have to pull lambs. There's no assisting. If I do, if I ever did, it'd be gone. Um, you know, you've got to, you've got to be ready to, with the livestock, you know, and you can sell, save yourself a lot of headaches. Cause I've, there've been some places where I've got some stuff where, um, shouldn't have, um, you know, get, find a producer that is, has philosophies where the livestock are survivors and easy keepers. Um, and then the only other thing it is, you know, with that, with the cool season perennial break or just a perennial break, I'm not sure what, you know, everybody's situation would be, but, you know, if you start thinking of it in windows, you, you need, you're going to need some perennial, some native perennial grass kind of to get you through that summer period. Then with us, after wheat harvest, uh, we plant a diverse cover and then, you know, that starts to grow and is available, you know, starting around probably August 15th. So, it, cause it needs, you know, a month and a half to grow and that, that kind of fills a fall window. And um, then when, for us, one of the, I mean, there's probably other things, but really for the most part, rye, rye, barley, um, triticale uh, are the only things that really will grow in the winter. And they don't grow much usually, but it gives, you know, it gives you a place to turn things out, maybe feed, feed hay until you get into that March 15th or the spring. And then you just get this, you have this huge amount of grazing from you know, April 15th till May 15th. Um, so just, you know, making sure you get everything set up so you've got places you can go with everything. Because um, that perennial break, probably depending on how you do it, isn't gonna, you know, keep them all year. I'll just second Josh's, everything he said. I agree with him on all those. About time here for two two more questions, um, and they all kind of revolve around the same thing. Um, Tony asks, were you able to establish your pastures under the cover crop using the cover crop as a nurse crop? And if so, what sort of mix did you use? So there's been a lot of questions that we've gotten about um, what species you used, whether it was wheat or oats. Um, so I guess if you guys want to touch on that real quick on 
if you were able to use cover crops to establish those perennials. Um, I, well, I, I could have, uh, usually we would plant in both of these covers. Well, I guess the first year I did it in the, or the first time I did it in the spring. Um, I think it's probably better to do it in the fall. So I've been, I planted it after wheat this last time and just let it go to weeds grazed it with the sheep and the cattle, and then planted it, um, I'm gonna say August 15th. So, you know, whenever you plant alfalfa and that stuff, you wanna get it in early enough, get it established, stay off it until the spring, you know, kind of give it, let it get established. So we are gonna have a little bit of a dormant period, but for me, it, um, I'd say going forward, it's after wheat, so it's not going into a in a, a cover. Um, I don't know. Maybe I should try and plant something for a month and a half. But yeah, I guess I I just soon let it go to weeds and volunteer wheat. <laughs> we used oats the first time as a, a helper crop because that's what we saw down in South America. And the second time we just kind of like what Josh did after a spring crop, planted something, grazed it real hard. And then, well, then let it come back, which seems odd. And then if I remember right, then we planted and like Josh said, would you be doing alfalfa? We haven't really come up with a plan, but definitely fall seeding seems to be where we have had our, that both times work the best. Okay. We, we've had some questions, uh, quite a few questions about winter time. What do you do in winter time? Where are your cattle grazing? Is that where you were going, Noah? Or no, nope, but I'll let you do that one. We'll do we'll do two more questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, We've had several questions revolve around winter. You know, what are your cattle doing during the winter? You have problems with pugging the ground. Yeah, you can't. I mean, on that first perennial break that I planted six years ago, yeah, they would overwinter on that that break. Um, I had less numbers, so I would I'd move them every day in the winter to give them just a little bit of stockpile, just to kind of give them a little something to graze. And then would they'd have just brome hay uh, to fill up on. And yeah, when you get into the a wet spring and the thaw comes out, you it's hard to move them fast enough. Um, but yeah, you could get, I mean, that's part of the, making sure you kind of have a plan ahead of time is like this winter. And so, and what I've been trying to do is keep them off that perennial break. So I don't pug it up and tear it up. I give them a lot bigger area than they probably need where I've just got rye planted. There's no, other, there's no rye there to graze yet. So they're, they're still eating hay, but they're out there. I'm unrolling that hay. So what they don't clean up, will go back into the soil because I'm unrolling it. You know, they're spread out, depositing manure and treating it almost like a fertilizer application out there in the cropland. So, I mean, there's lots of options of where to keep them in the winter. Just yeah. I, I will off. note that when, when I when I design a pasture mix for this purpose, um, I usually like to have number one some uh, rhizomatous species like a, a I I hate smooth brome as a monoculture, but as a minor component of a pasture mix like this, because brome is rhizomatous, it will fill in after a you know, with some rest, it'll fill in after a pugging incident. Another thing I like is like, you know, Keith, you got the crabgrass in there. 
a reseeding high quality annual that if you get a bare spot, you've got crabgrass seed that'll fill in in the summer or, you know, like an annual ryegrass that can fill in from a fall bugging incident. You know, you've got you've got substitutes if one of the starters gets injured, in other words. What else have we got here, Noah? Yeah, so the last question that I was gonna ask um, revolved around planting methods. A lot of people were asking about broadcasting things versus a no-till drill. Um, any kind of tips that you guys have on what works best for getting these established? We use our no-till drill and uh, plant, I'm gonna guess about an inch deep. Um, I'm not, we just bought a sunflower drill to kind of fill in. So I got John Deere's what we've always used before, but we got this, bought this other drill to, because sometimes I'm planning and my son wants to do, so we almost kind of needed another drill to touch up, you might say. That's we're, we're honestly, to be honest with you, there's lots of experimenting going on on our farm. <laughs> And I hate to say what we're doing is like the way to do it. So a lot of experimenting, uh, trying different things to see what works the best. It's a work in progress, how I'm gonna put it. In here, yeah, we have a- But a good drill. A John Deere air seeder and set it, I, just set it a half inch or three quarters. It seems like a lot of that stuff doesn't want to be planted real deep. And um, this last time, one of the things I did do different was um, on one angle, I planted um, kind of the grass chicory part of the mix. And then on the other angle, planted the clovers, alfalfas, kind of like people do with alfalfa stands where you, instead of having everything at a seven and a half, when you, you grid it up and maybe get a little bit better overall stand. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, just pray for rain once you put it in. Where I'm at. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know we did the same as Josh Noah. We planted one way and then we planted another way, half rate. And then if, if I remember right, then we came back later and planted the crabgrass later. Sure. Yeah. All right, well, I do apologize you guys that we, we ran late on time and didn't get to all of your questions. So if there's something that you didn't get answered that you really are, are dying to know, please feel free to send me an email. Uh, it's just Noah, N-O-A-H, at greencoverseed.com. And uh, we will try to get those answered. I'll either pass them on um, or we'll try to get them answered here on our end. So thank you guys, uh, Keith and Josh, for your time. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you very much, guys. That was excellent. Yes, it was was wonderful. Um, before I get to your final thoughts, next week we do have um, – Keith is going to be interviewing a representative with Indigo Ag. Um, one of the things that we keep hearing about is these carbon credits, and uh, there's a lot of questions on whether or not it's, um, yeah, just lots of questions on whether or not that's going to come to fruition. And so we want to sit down and get it right from the horse's mouth, and Keith will be interviewing Indigo Egg next week to get some of those answers. That'll be at 530. Um, with that, I guess, Keith, Josh, do you guys have any final words of wisdom for us before we let you go? Believe in the biology. Sounds yeah. good. That's all you need. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining and have a great rest of your week.